Podcasters. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be having an idea episode and we're going to be talking about how to connect people with data. And to, to have help us with this conversation, we brought in Robert Cook, who is the CTO and founder of 3Forge. So how are you doing today, Robert? Good. How you been, Chris? I'm good. And I'm good. So now where are you located out of? Uh, we are in the New York area. So today I'm at the office. We do offices a few days a week. Uh, so I'm in the right near the Fulton Station downtown in Manhattan. Okay. Okay. So Yankee or Met fan? <laughs> uh, I guess I have to be a Yankees fan. I live close to the Yankee Stadium. So yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, that, we'll get we'll get you know the important stuff out the way first, right? But man, for Ro- Robert. Give our listeners, you know, they may not have heard of three fours. Maybe give us a brief overview of you, your company, what you're doing, and, and how you're trying to serve others. Sure. Yeah, I'll I'll start with a quick background on myself. Sure. So, uh, really, my whole life, I've been into computers. Very fascinated um, what they could do. Before I even really understood what a computer was, I knew just something about it. I'd I'd, I'd love it once I got into it, and that's exactly really in in a nutshell. My life story has been playing with computers as i call it you know sometimes i'd get yelled at they'd say well it's really work not play but i still look at it as you know playing with computers um and uh, and uh you know then uh, probably in my late teens i started to really get interested in in what it means for humans to interact with data um as as you know computers started evolving and data started growing um this is now like the the early 90s i started thinking about well how how is it and how do computers and data and humans interact. And I'm not necessarily talking about the mouse and the keyboard, but really how, how what is that relationship between humans and data? Um, and uh, I, then I went um, kind of through a typical career path. I was at um, uh, Bear Stearns for a few years. I was um, chief architect at the Dark Pool Liquid Net. Uh, and then in around 2010, I started uh, a three forge I was the founder of three forge um but you know along that along that journey and I, I skipped over a few parts but along that journey i had many different roles different capacities um i was on uh middle office back office front office high frequency trading um regulatory reporting many different many different roles and responsibilities and and what i realized is that um you know a lot of these problems were very common it didn't really matter. It was it was almost industry agnostic, uh, and and I felt that you know there really was room for what we call a platform, um, a full stack platform, and so that's really what Three Forge has focused on is building out a full stack platform, and and by that I mean um, providing the tools and widgets you need out of the box so that humans can interact with data. And at a very high level, when I say humans interacting with data, we've broken that into three categories. One is um, humans being able to ask a question to a computer and get an answer back. So the analogy I use is like Google, right? You Google something. Um, the second thing is being able to have information pushed to the screen so that you can react to that in real time. An analogy there would be you receive an email. Um, and then the third way would be actually data entry, inputting data into a system. Right. And so really those three categories is, is what we focus the company on. And then from there, there's this huge rabbit hole of the tons and tons of different techniques and technologies we've used so that, you know, a, a set of users can interact with very large, vast amounts of data. Right, right. Well, I mean, it sounds very, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm curious. Let's let maybe let's break those three areas down. It sounds like you know, real time moving data. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you have that request request response piece and the data entry. So, go a little bit further exp- and explain what you know those three areas because I think that would really help paint the picture for our listeners out there. Sure, sure. So each one of them has its unique challenges. Um, so for the real time, that's actually what we started with, um, was being able to do the real time streaming data. I think that's actually the the most overlooked um, of these three things is the ability to actually process real time data and get that up onto the screen. Um, and, and I think by way of example, most web pages you go to are really somewhat static. I mean, things might be moving around and there's animated videos trying to sell you stuff, but, but generally speaking, if you want things to change, you're hitting F5, you're going to a new page. So basically for real time streaming, um, what we needed to do first was set it up so that we could connect to many live streams of data, Mm -hmm. different types of data, bring that in. Um, We then have a CEP, a complex event processing engine. So you can take data from multiple streams, tie that together, do something interesting with it. But then ultimately you want to take that information and push it up onto the screen so humans can see it. And this really comes down to, um, 
you know, when when you when you're talking about real time processing of millions or billions of rows, if I put a billion rows on the screen, that that really isn't doesn't get you a whole lot. So it's really around the tooling that's necessary to let people quickly filter down and find that data. So what might be interesting if you have a, a, a millions of records would be able to sort by a certain column in real time and see what's happening. So imagine you've got all your flights, you could sort and see which airlines, um, which, which flights are furthest behind schedule or ahead of schedule, or maybe you wanna be able to filter. I'm interested in all planes of this type of model. And so, you know, being able to very quickly set these sort of filters and parameters and then immediately see what's happening in real time is, is, is very valuable to our customers. So that's, that's, the first, that's the first component at a high level right. around the real time part. Yeah. Um, now, the, the request response has a whole different set of challenges, which in and of itself I, I've found fascinating and, and it, it never ceases to surprise me in the new ways that we can, we can um, advance, this, advance our tooling for this. So in the simplest case, when you think asking a question, getting an answer would be run a query on a database. Like I want to know, you know, what... Um, what what McDonald's or you know what restaurant is nearest to where I am? That that's kind of a simple. Right. That's a that's a simple you know asking a question to one system, getting a response back. But what often happens, almost inevitably, with our customers is they have many many different systems, and in order to actually get a a complete answer to a question, you need to actually visit lots of different systems, mm -hmm. um, compile the data together, and then provide the answer. Okay. Um, so it, an example I would use. Um, and I'll, and you know my background's in, in finance, um, so I'll, I'll choose finance. Um, let's say you know the question is how much something as simple as how much money it um, do I have? How much exposure do I have in the market right now? Right. Um, I as an end user um, for for a bank. And the on one hand that sounds like a simple question. You go, you find out how much money they have sitting out in the market, and you get the answer back. The problem is there's many different markets. Those markets are accessed by a variety of different systems. You've got moving FX rates, so maybe they're in different currencies, et cetera, et cetera. So actually to get that answer back, we may visit 20 or more systems in real time. So mm -hmm. the user asks the question, we visit this system, we visit that system. Based on the answer from that system, we go to the third system. So we call that cascading queries, which the idea is you query one system, you get the answer back, and then based on that answer, we automatically will query another system. Okay. And then you keep doing that, right? right. So, the analogy, so the analogy I like to use is, you know, go back to... Um, I would like to know where the nearest pizza place is to where I'm located. The first thing you have to do is you have to ask the phone, where are you located? All right, now you know the geolocation. Second thing, or you know, I should say, how long would it take to get there? Then the second thing you have to do is find out where is the nearest restaurant. Mm -hmm. All right, And then after you've done that, now you have to look up the traffic situation and, and figure out what the traffic is and the best route, et cetera, et cetera. So you actually have to query many systems to do that. Now, I think one of the issues is in, in almost, and obviously we know there's tools that can do that. Uh, but the thing is, those tools have been very hard coded and, and, and tons and tons of developer time have been gone into solving those problems. And those problems are very important to be solved. So it's worth the industry pouring billions of dollars into creating things like Google Maps, et cetera. Um, but a lot of times these questions and answers are important, but they don't necessarily warrant spending billions of dollars to go and build all this manually. And so we had to come up with a solution to make it easy. And so that's something we focused a lot on. And then the third thing is data, data entry itself. So data entry um, is, I think, a little bit more natural and understandable. I mean, it's, you know, you have your typical types of, you know, text area, text input boxes, buttons, validation, things like that. And then you get a little bit more interesting when you get into the workflow aspect of it. So a lot of times it's um, an operator will enter in some information. Once they've completed entering that information, that then creates a ticket in another system or for another user to, to then, you know, authorize that. And then maybe it goes up to an admin if there's a break and et cetera, et cetera. So you've got data entry and workflow I kind of use interchangeably because in, in most enterprise situations, it's the both. But I think the fascinating thing as a high level is once you've solved real time, the ability to ask questions to a computer and the ability to enter data into a computer with workflows, there's really actually just about no use case that you can't solve right. if you've solved those components right. when it comes to how, how humans interact with data. Yeah, I mean, really soup to nuts. I mean, you cover the whole gamut there, right? 
<laughs> I like to think so, you know, and, and, and actually what the, the most exciting thing for me is when we get a use case and wow, th this is something that the tool doesn't do. And then that gives me a whole new opportunity to, 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 to build something new. Yeah. So you had the, the, the industrial IIoT and the issues right now, trying to get the data from the plant floor in a usable format to make these decisions, to make the, to make the plants run better. So I'm curious for, from your model at three forge, you know, have some of the issues that you've solved maybe outside of, of the industrial sector, what do they need to be thinking about? You know, how could they start solving some of these problems? Right. So, um, yeah, a, a great question. So, so first off, um, I actually, in, in my experience, and we've worked with, you know, several other industries outside of, um, FinTech. Um, but what I think is fascinating is, you know, computers, if you think about the history of computers, I mean, in the beginning, uh, if you take away like, you know, wars and things like that, military, right. really computers have mostly been focused on um, business operations, specifically in accounting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the reason I mentioned that is because I look at it as fintech has actually seen and addressed a lot of the issues ahead of other industries, just because they've been in it longer. Okay. You know, computers were being heavily used in the 80s um, you know, within finance and, and more and more so. So we're talking about systems that have 30 years of legacy, 40 years of legacy. And so we've seen a lot of what it means to have a hodgepodge of systems and trying to bring all that together. And so I always tell people, you know, when you're in another industry, I think it's worth looking at your predecessors right. to see what sort of problems they've solved. Right. Anyway, so that's, that's kind of a, um, a lead into your question. Um, so when it comes to uh, basically being able to, and, and I'm going to kind of bucket this into the IoT. Okay. When it comes to being able, you've got lots of different sets of data or lots of different systems, and they're each producing independent sets of data. Mm -hmm. um, that data is being produced in real time. So it's going to fall into that first bucket I was talking about of real time data. That data now through what we call the relay layer is, is basically um, a set of software components with lots of different adapters that are designed to consume data from the different systems. Okay. Um, once it passes through the relay layer, which we actually think of as an immune system, and I can talk more about that in a minute, why this is an important thing to have, and, and, and unfortunately we see it lacking a lot. But the idea of the immune system is that as that data is traveling in, you wanna make sure it meets certain heuristics. So for example, if you've got a temperature gauge and that temperature gauge is, is giving you, you know, negative Calvin or something. I mean, right there, you know, you've got an issue. You don't even want to send that upstream. You want to try to solve those things right. actually almost at the point of contact. In the moment. So in the moment, right, exactly. And, and so this kind of gives you a layer where you can uh, focus locally on these issues. Once it passes through that relay layer, then it goes into what we call the center layer. Right. Um, and this is just the things we've named it, we've branded it. Um, the center layer is really the brains of the operations. I mentioned CEP before. So going back to CEP, um, complex event processing, that's now you're taking the data from the different streams, marrying it together. Um, a lot of times you're doing things like windowing across the data to look for certain anomalies or, or changing trends. Right. Um, and then a lot of times you're comparing that with historical data. And then when something interesting happens, you put that up on the screen. And now the operator can say, oh, my gosh, look at this. The temperature is too high over in this region or this component is falling behind or we've got a backup in this area. Right. Right. And and the, and now comes the second part of this, which is being able to ask a computer a question. And this, again, I think is it, again, if you look to fintech. Um, for a long time in fintech, when there was an alert raised, that alert would sit on one system. Right. And the way to actually diagnose was a completely different system. And over time, they realized, wait, you know, marrying this together is what makes sense. Right. You know, after the alert takes place, you want to be able to click on that alert and immediately get the surrounding data. Mm -hmm. it, and, it, and it matter, and it's and it's good for any industry to have this. Um, and so this now becomes asking the question. So let's say you see an alert come up on the screen, you're an operator, and now you want to know all the surrounding information, you know? So now you click on it and, and now it could bring up a screen that says, okay, it asks a question to all the different relays, which asks to the, to the hardware, it gets back. Now you can see the full picture of what's going on. And maybe this is a serious issue. Now you could click a button, type in something, hit submit, and now that's going to send it to maybe the field operator down on the floor so that they can take some action. So the idea of addressing all three of these components, real time, plus asking questions, plus being able to do workflows, right. can take a, a long process of, of, of what we call the, the, the copy and paste nightmare of taking data from this and entering into that, and you take this and you go do that, and then you can condense that down. 
And depending on the industry, I mean, this could be a life life or death situation. Yeah. Or in the case of finance, it could be, you know, in finance, when you have a, a, like a flash crash, we're talking about millions of dollars a second. Right. That can be lost. Right. So it's about being able to make, you know, go from um, anomaly detection to decision making. Yeah. If you can cut that from one minute down to 10 seconds, that's great. That's great for everyone. I mean, you know, not only does it save the employer time, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's just, it's a good thing to have. There's less room for mistakes and all that. So that's an analogy. So that, I think that is where I feel that this fits in very well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, from a manufacturing standpoint, you're, I'm thinking safety for people and just improving, exactly. improving processes and things like that. I'm also concerned because I, I, I know, not concerned, but I, I'm curious your take on, I've seen the amount of data that a lot of these these IoT devices now have. I mean, from variable frequency mm-hmm. drives to sensors. I mean, you just get a little photo eye now, Robert. It's it's unreal the amount of data that that is available on, on <laughs> all. The, and then you think of a of a plant, you know, or a facility with thousands of them, and they each have thousands of data points. All of a sudden, the math gets really big from a, from a from from a size of the data information. So. How, how do you how do you maybe calm someone down when they're trying to manage that massive amount of information coming at them at a rapid pace? Just breathe. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, I. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the thing is, uh, and, and actually, I, I, I didn't really talk about the roadmap of the product itself, but years 2010 to 2013 were solely focused on the ability to scale. That, that was the first thing we focused on, which is horizontal scalability. Right. And, and we break scalability into two uh, dimensions. Okay. We have horizontal scalability, which means you're taking a node and you have multiple of them. Right. So go back to the relays. So let's say you've got thousands of IoT devices. They're all producing tons of data. You can continue to add more relays. Maybe each relay is responsible for a few dozen devices. Yeah. And it takes that dozens of devices that comes in and the relay tries to condense and normalize and compress and find the interesting information. Those relays then can send the data out. So adding more relays is what it was, we would call that horizontal scaling. Adding And then now vertical scaling would be you're adding layers to the process. So we right now, we have several layers. I'm going to cover three of them. There's actually five. I don't know if I want to get into that today. But the three layers that are interesting, I think, for this conversation is the relay layer, right. which I just talked about. Then the center layer, which is where we're doing the complex event processing. Mm-hmm. And then what we call the web layer or UI layer, which is where humans are interacting with it. Okay. So, so, so the whole idea is you've got trillions of records coming in. Um, at the base layer that makes its way into the relay the relay is doing as good a job as it can of condensing that down maybe it drops a few zeros from that that then makes its way up to the center layer where the center layer is taking that data in that refined cleaned up data and it's looking for certain interesting anomalies and when that takes place that then makes its way up to the web layer and now the web layer is, is is broadcasting that out to all the operators that are logged in right and so it's and and this is and this is literally how how our technology is built so you can run the whole thing on a on a raspberry pi yeah as a single component right or you can split it out horizontally and vertically and we do have cases um to just to put things in in numbers within finance um you know a market data feed uh can easily produce five hundred thousand. um if you're talking about an options so options trading market five hundred thousand events a second is is pretty common and and so there's really <laughs> the only way you're going to do 500,000 events a second um is to is is to have this horizontal scaling yes so the numbers are are, are very large that we're used to yeah well, man, that, that that was a perfect visual because i can totally see that because that at that point you're just kind of you're filtering it up to what matters and you're helping that the, the the end user actually have the data that, that makes a difference right and maybe i'm curious from your from that standpoint you know, getting the data that matters is the magic sauce, right? And particularly for magic for manufacturing, because again, that sensor may have a thousand points, but I only care about two of them. <laughs> so, yeah, it's you know, it is it? the needle. It is the needle in the haystack, and and the irony is when you do this stuff in real time. So there's really two, broadly speaking, there's two approaches. You can either say as the needle is being produced in the haystack, as the hay is being produced, you're looking through it for that needle. Okay. The alternative way is you have a big stack of hay and you start digging in to find the needle. Yeah. It's actually much it's it's better in every way to be looking for the needle as the haystack is being produced. 
because mm -hmm. as the hay is coming through, you're looking for it. And so that's what's nice about doing these real time systems, because the alternative is you could say, OK, well, every hour we'll run a job to see what happened over the last hours or something interesting. And now we'll raise an alert on it. You're actually better trying to process it in real time. And um, going back to what you're saying before is you're trying to filter up to that interesting data. But then keep in mind that this horizontal, these each one of these nodes still remembers all the data around it. It still knows about all the hay around the needle, mm -hmm. right? So once you find that that proverbial needle in the haystack, you can ask, well, what is what's around that needle, right? Right, and you can go down the stack and get that information. And so I'm over and over again. I'm, I, I repeat, it really comes down to real time plus being able to ask questions plus being able to have workflows. Right. But again, yeah. at the core too, though, you need to know what the needle is, right? What you're looking for. And that's the fun part. Right. You know, that's what, that's what, I mean, we have, so really three forges, um, uh, I would say on the, on the product side, we're broken into two, two mm -hmm. groups. We mm -hmm. have the solutions engineers and then we have the product development. So I'm on the I, I focus on the product development. It's what I love to do. It's what I started the company to do. But then the solutions engineers, they're the ones that really work with the customer to say, oh, this is, you know, these this is what you mean by a needle. Right. And then and then and then you and, and sometimes our customers build build the systems on, on top of it. And then okay. or they configure it, you could say. Sometimes we configure it. So, that's yeah. cool. But that's the fun part. Yeah. So if you if you're if you're wanting to to get into this and be like a data guru or start looking for those needles, what what are the skill sets? What do you need to you know where do you need to be studying? What 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 paths do you need to be able to to do this effectively? I'll tell you what I there's there's you know I've I've boiled it down to this. Um, uh, it might be a little computer sciencey the second half. The first part is math. I mean I, I just it cannot I, I cannot overstate. Like when I was a kid, I wasn't that into math. Then I realized how important math was for computers. And, and I had to go back like, oh, why didn't I just pay attention in school? But it really, you know, <laughs> and then I kind of caught up in college, but, but, but I, I cannot stress enough how important math is if you want to be a data scientist. I mean, right. to be able to understand heuristics, you know, things like understanding cardinality, those sorts of things. And the second thing I always look for, um, I don't really care too much about like the language that people are interested in, whether it's Python or Perl, or you can, whatever right. it happens to be, um, Java, C++. I'm, I'm actually more interested in the fundamentals of, of data structures. And that's what I mean. This is about computer science. -y. Okay. But like, you know, the different ways that people can store data and access it and, and the amount of time it takes based on the type of data structure you're using. So again, it's very math oriented. So that to me, anyone who asks me, what should I, what should I learn if I want to work in three, four, I'm like math. I mean, right. That's, that's what we interview on. Okay. Yeah. Calculus and, and uh, yeah. What about if they want to get into the management side, you know, of, of data? I mean, any advice there of, of how to, or does it start at the ground level and really work its way up? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I'm, uh, I, I'm, I believe in the school. I mean, it's interesting because I know very good managers that aren't technical. And I also know very good managers that are technical. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I, I can't, I, I kind of change depending on who I'm working with. I change my view as to which is better because sometimes when people, I mean, I, I, I frankly am a highly technical manager. Um, I don't know if, <laughs> you know, I've kind of spent my life thinking about this. So I know I fall into a particular group and I, and, and, and you run the risk of uh, when you do that, well, are, you know, am, am I starting to micromanage Right. Um, the actual development of stuff, right? As right. opposed to if you have a manager who isn't so involved. So I think I, I, I may not be the best person to honestly answer that. My opinion is I like technical managers. I okay. can have, you know, it's easier for me to go out drinking with them. <laughs> <laughs> they love the honesty. Love it. I love it. Well, Robert, I, I've, I've learned a ton and we call it eco ask why. So we always wrap up with the why we're Robert. So, you know, why is connected people and data so critical to success of manufacturers in the future? Mm -hmm. Um, well, because the amount, of, well, okay, this is how I'd put it. The, what we've realized in finance over the last few years, I shouldn't say we, what the, the, the tier one banks, tier two, tier three banks, the large financial institutions of the world have realized is that your data is not a cost. It's an asset, right? For a lot of time, it was like, oh, I got to store all this data for seven years for regulatory compliance. I got to take this data. I got to manage it. I got to have hardware to store it. I got to send it off to you know, Iron Mountain, so it can be preserved on tape for seven years. And, and now um, they've realized, wait a second, all that data is sitting there and you can analyze it all and you can get information about 
what the customer needs, how to improve the experience, et cetera. So I would say it's the same thing here, which is, well, yes, there's the real time sort of being able to interact with these things. Um, and that, that I think a majority of this call has been about, or this podcast has been about, but I think equally important is having this data at the end of the day, it's going to, it's going to speak volumes when you really learn to analyze it as to where are the gaps in your processes? Um, where can you be more efficient in certain areas? You know, is, is there a particular sector of, of, of your facility that could be improved, et cetera. And it's all sitting in the data. It's just, right. How do you get to it? You know what I mean? And, it, and it's almost like I, I, a lot of times when we get into this stuff, it almost feels like a spy, like like I'm watching like a like a Law and Order or something. You know? Yeah. You know the data is there. You you know, know there. you can solve it. You, you just gotta, gotta, find, gotta find, it. find it. Exactly. You gotta find it. <laughs> it sounds like yeah. the journey's the far, the fun part. It is. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Robert, where should, where can people connect with you? Where do you want them to go to learn more about what you're doing? Mm -hmm. uh, Three Forge. What, you know, we'll sync it up. But just if you want to call that out now, that'd be great. Yeah, awesome. So um, three things, threeforge.com, number three, F-O-R-G-E.com. That just talks about the product and ways to contact us. You can always reach out at info at threeforge.com. Uh, and really, our, for social media, we've, we've really focused it all on uh, LinkedIn. So okay. if you look for Three Forge at LinkedIn, um, we, we, we publish probably every other day. Um, some interesting article on some sort of problem that we're solving this and that. And we're always adding new adapters and, and putting all of that online. So, yeah. LinkedIn awesome. is the best place. Yeah. Awesome. We'll, we'll make sure all that stuff synced up for you, for you listeners in the show notes, Robert, it's been a, a lot of fun learning about connecting people with data. I, I've come a awesome. long way in this, this time together. So, so thank you all so right. much for your time today, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now that was a fun conversation with Chris. I'll tell you what, that he just fun energy, uh, lots of insight, but his answer on mentorship, go back and listen to it. If you didn't capture everything that he, that he went through there, that's a big opportunity there. There's the opportunity to grow and learn from others, particularly the world that we live in now. It's so connected. Find someone one step, two steps ahead of you and, how, and then learn from them. And then when you get there, keep searching. You know, the mentors, they grow, they evolve. Obviously, we're going to have mentors at our workplace. We get that. But we're talking about there's so many more opportunities to grow. And Chris's definition of mentorship and how he looks at that and also how he mentors others, huge huge so again go back check that out he's doing wonderful things highly encourage you guys go check out catalyst consulting if you're a manufacturer out there and you need some support with your with your marketing efforts chris and his his group they're doing some great work so if you're liking eco ask why give us a rating write a review that makes a big difference we're still collecting war stories as well so check out the show notes there's a link you can send us a direct message for those war stories you know the good the bad the ugly the stuff you tell around the water cooler the stuff you'll remember the rest of your life we want to hear those stories so that we can share with others so we hope you enjoyed this if you did again share that with others and, and hope we hope you have a great week and remember to keep asking why